evening, everyone. My name is Cassie Hopkins, and I coordinate the webinars for Hausman Johnson Insurance. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar on the Affordable Care Act update by Pat Kelly. Today's webinar will run the full hour. If there is time after the webinar, we will have a question and answer session. If you have a question during the webinar, feel free to type it into the question feature, and Pat will address it. After the webinar is over, there will be a short survey we are hoping you can fill out for us. Also, please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and will be available for review on the webinar archives of our website. If you do not want to participate in a recorded webinar, you may want to close the application at this time. You will receive a follow-up email from GoToWebinar with a link to the recording and the presentation slides. I would now like to introduce you to our presenter for today's webinar, Pat Kelly. Pat has been with Hausman Johnson Insurance since 2011 and has over 30 years of experience in employee benefits. He is passionate about building a relationship with clients beyond just being a product vendor. He forms client connections through honest communication, continuous education, and always does the things he says he's going to do. Pat works with employers of all sizes and with both fully insured and self-funded medical clients, including defined contribution, HRA, HSA, and SSA. He also works with clients on their disability, life, dental, and vision needs. We are extremely grateful Pat can be with us today and share his knowledge on this topic. Welcome, Pat. Thank you, Cassie, and good morning, everybody, and thanks for thanks for uh, logging in and listening to the to the webinar. Um, so let's uh, go through the agenda for today. Uh, agenda: uh, We're going to talk about association health plans, um, and that I'll tell you now that's going to be at the thirty or forty thousand foot level because we are just starting to now, you know, getting a lot of information on the complexities of, of the laws of this and you know, a lot of things still working out in states and courts and things like that. But uh, uh, so obviously we'll talk about that and there'll be more to come in the future. Uh, individual mandate, we'll talk about that. Short-term health insurance, uh, you know, I'll bring up what's, what's going on with the new guidelines on short-term limited duration health insurance. Then we'll get into large employer penalty affordability updates, the IRS notifications that hopefully none of you have received, but maybe some of you have received the uh, shared responsibility payment letters, notification of the individual subsidy letters that are also part of uh, forms that you should be receiving. Um, and it's kind of on again, off again, extensions and delays, kind of a section on, you know, where is the can being kicked down the road again or and so forth. Uh, ACA reporting, uh, there's an IRS proposal out there to expand electronic filing and, you know, talk about qualified small employer health reimbursement arrangement, health savings accounts, and then I'm going to lead you later on on a little bit of work, workplace wellness and compliance issues and so forth. So let's start out with talking about a uh, hot topic these days, association health plans. Uh, there there's a lot going on with these, with states, uh, and how are they going to be managed? Uh, you know, it, it's good to see these that are out there, that these are available, but there's a lot of hurdles that, that need, to, need to be cleared uh, before association health plans can be set up. Uh, we've talked to carriers in the state of Wisconsin, and carriers are very interested in partnering with associations on association health plans, AHPs. Uh, but at this time, everybody's waiting for a bulletin to come out from the Wisconsin Office of Commissioner of Insurance on guidelines. Uh, there's current guidelines for association plans that were in effect prior to this rule, um, and those guidelines are different with the new AHP rules and Wisconsin needs, the state of Wisconsin needs to act on, the, on that. Uh, and currently, the Wisconsin OCI has very strict guidelines on self-funded associations. Um, currently, I don't know of any, any self-funded or, for that matter, any fully insured association plans providing coverage at, at this time in Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin's, you know, pretty, though well fully insured, me was, uh, for the most part, or association plans, I'm sorry, I threw a term out there that 
I didn't want to use because it could confuse people because of one of the guidelines, you know, that every, all these hurdles that have to be jumped and cleared and so forth. But um, for the most part, the fully insured association plans uh, that have that may be out there, uh, maybe not ready new business, but maybe out there, you know, been pretty pretty okay. Wisconsin's okay with those because they're dealing with insurance companies that have currently been licensed and approved to do business in the state of Wisconsin. It's the self-funded plans that are <clears throat> are highly scrutinized and so forth, and they will be moving forward uh, as well. So we're just waiting to see them from the state how they're going to act on um, these plans as they're set up. So, um, as I, I was just talking about, uh, even though the federal government has, has uh, passed the AHP guidelines, states can continue to regulate those. And we're already hearing there are some states out there that are not going to allow them, just flat out not going to allow them. And they're going to fight them tooth and nail. And, and you know, they're not, you know, when you look at political parties, they're not just states that are, you know, one political party control. Uh, there are both Republican and Democratic states that are looking at not allowing these association health plans. And basically it's because of history. Uh, not on the fully insured ones, but mostly on self-funded association plans have not had a good history for the most part uh, in, in our country and so forth, it, you know, because they're hard to control. Uh, why were AHPs you know, really who pushed hard for association health plans? Um, you know, they were intended to level a playing field to allow small employers, even individual you know, employers of down to one employee, sole proprietorships with no employees, to band together uh, to have access to the same type of health insurance that large employers can provide. And you know, banding together by geography, banding together by industry uh, to purchase group insurance plans. That's kind of why they've been formed. Uh, now, if someone, most associations that are out there now are out there, and they provide many services uh, uh, to, to their to their members and so forth. So it would be very easy for them if they got states that allow it to start and start expanding and growing an association health plan. Um, but if there's associations out there that are being formed today solely for the purpose of providing health insurance, they can't do that. Uh, associations need to show that they're at least providing one other substantial business purpose uh, not related to health coverage or other employee benefits to be able to be uh, an association set up to provide health insurance. So they have to have other business purposes as well. So, go ahead. Just a timeline um, on associations, uh, if they are to be formed and provide, uh, provide medical coverage to the AHP rule, all associations, new and existing, may establish a fully insured AHP on September 1st. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen in Wisconsin because the insurance commissioner of Wisconsin did not come out and told the insurance companies. Uh, what they're going to need to do to comply with comply with the laws and so forth. Existing associations have sponsored an association health plan on it before the date the final rule was published may establish a self-funded association health plan uh, January 1st. And then all other associations, new or existing, have to wait. If they're going to have a self-funded AHP, they have to wait till April 1st of 2019. So it's going to take some time before before these things uh, uh, come out. And um, just uh, a couple of things, this is, uh, this is new, there's a lot of things going on it's state by state, trying to, try to work with the feds, uh, trying to work with other laws that have been out there like ERISA and so forth. Uh, big difference whether they're fully insured or self-funded. <clears throat> like I said earlier, a lot of, a lot of hurdles. Uh, actually, the first webinar is that I've seen on AHPs is this afternoon at, at 12 o'clock. So I'm going to sit and listen to that. So hopefully uh, uh, if there's a lot of good information that I don't have this morning that I pick up on this afternoon. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll find ways to get that out to those that have signed up and, and listened to the webinar. And, and there's a lot of things in news articles uh, and 
you know, I try to read those with a grain of salt, but uh, you read them and you see what you say. And, and, you know, right after the law was passed, one of the biggest promoters of association plans, and they should be uh, for their clients, is uh, the National Federation of Independent Businesses. Uh, very good organization, uh, and they want to do right for their clients. And they were one of the biggest lobbying groups in D.C. pushing for this rule. Uh, and they've been promoting association plans for at least two decades. Uh, right after the rule got passed and they got a good chance to look at it, uh, their comment was they're not going to set one up, describing the new Trump rules as unworkable uh, because it's state by state. And that, that's going to be the most confusing thing for, for plans to set up uh, if they want to market their coverage in more than one state. So with that, uh, enough set on association plans. Uh, there's going to be a lot more to come. Uh, the individual mandate, uh, again, I want to touch base on that. And there's a reason why I'm kind of talking about the individual coverage here is it can affect employer coverage as well. Uh, the repeal of the individual mandate, as I, we all, I think, know, has no effect on the employer mandate even in 2019. So, you know, if an employer receives a marketplace subsidy, it can still trigger an employer penalty in 2019. Now we know that, I think most of us know that the individual mandate is not going away in 2019, but there's gonna be no bite to the penalty because the tax is gonna be zero. So you can see down below, it's like sort of like getting a parking ticket where the fine is zero. That's what the individual mandate is going to be in 2019. But employees can still, or members, can still qualify for subsidies from the government for their individual plans that they purchase. And those will still uh, trigger penalties to employers if they're not providing uh, affordable coverage or minimum value coverage to their members. Uh, now, I also want to talk about short-term limited duration insurance, something new. Uh, pretty much, it kind of came in a uh, swath of bills passed by the, you know, by our current administration that included AHPs, also on the short-term limited duration insurance. Uh, this does not provide minimal essential coverage. So, if, you know, you have employees that are saying, I'm going to go buy these things and come off my group plan. Uh, Yes, uh, they can, obviously, you know, but they're going to be buying coverage that doesn't provide minimally essential coverage. Uh, so that means they could be subject to penalties. So if they do that this year, they could still be subject to penalties. Obviously, if they do it next year, there's no more ACA penalties on individual. So we could see some employees coming off a group health plan. Uh, you know, maybe they can buy these minimum limited duration policies at a less expensive cost than what it costs them to participate in your health plan. So that could happen. Uh, what's making these more advanced is they can now be issued for a period of up to 12 months. And they could be renewed for up to 36 months in total, taking into account the renewals or extensions that they're offered. Now, these plans could be medically underwritten. And they're not considered health insurance per the ACA guidelines. So we've all heard that these plans can have, have uh, pre-existing condition limitations. They don't have to cover hospitalization if they don't want to. They can have limits on how much they pay. So they're, you know, individuals buying these are gonna really have to read through what they're buying to make sure that, you know, if someone does get in a bad accident that they're gonna have coverage for that. Uh, obviously the big, the big one here is the, you know, the pre-existing conditions. You know, I don't see individuals that have pre-existing conditions jump into these policies. It's not for them. Uh, really, what's going to happen, healthy people, I'm not going to say young people, they're people that are my age that might not have any pre-existing conditions, um, that are going to buy these policies if they can buy them at a, at a much less cost and they can buy individual plans on the market or maybe even their place of work. We don't know that. We haven't seen them, you know, we haven't seen the pricing on these yet. But 
anytime you have healthy people moving to another product, it affects the product they come from because it leaves less healthy people in that product. And whether that's individual plans out there or whether that on the ACA or whether that's employer plan. Um, you know, we don't want to see that exodus of good, healthy people leaving our plants because we need them to offset the whole plant itself and so forth. That's, you know, shared risk. Um, and what's going to happen with these is you can buy them for 12 months and you, you can renew them, but at, at, at the will of the company. So if you buy one and then develop a medical condition, when it comes up for renewal, you can be asked to, to re, they can request medical questions again, and you could be declined. So um, you can buy them for 12 and you could be declined. But what people are gonna do is they're gonna be buying these in conjunction with open enrollment for the ACA individual plan. So if they buy it, they get sick. Now they jump back into the ACA individual plan. You can see what's gonna be going on here is, you know, people are gonna be jumping out when they don't think they're gonna use it. They're gonna be jumping back into the ACA individual plans or back on a group plans at open enrollment when, uh, when they need it. And guess what? Those plans can apply for existing conditions and so forth. So um, enough on, on those and there'll be more to come there as well. So let's get into some six things uh, that we've been dealing with for five or six years now is, you know, the large employer penalty and affordability updates. Um, so we can see numbers here. Uh, I have to apologize to put all this on one screen. I had to get, I had to take off the 2015 and 2016 uh, lines here. And I kind of did that. I'm thinking, gee, maybe I should take, not include 18 and 19 because we're just getting our fines if we're getting them for, for 15. But uh, we've been looking at those for, you know, for a good three and a half years now. So hopefully we have those ingrained in our memory as to what they were for uh, 15 and 16. But uh, just uh, the employer penalty is always indexed off that original 2,000, 3,000 amount. And um, uh, for 17, you can see those numbers. You know, they're going up every year. We've, got, we've had the numbers for 18 out, obviously. If, if penalties are, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're doing any penalties for those years, we won't know until probably 2000 or 2021, um, 2020 or 21. But, uh, uh, and then for 19, uh, they're projected to be these numbers. And uh, they're not out yet, but projected. And they're basically, where do these estimates come from? Is premium adjustment percents from past years and so forth. Um, so that's kind of a guess, but I just thought I'd throw that out so we can see what they're doing. They are climbing up to be a little more substantial every year if the, if the employer mandate stays intact. Um, and then affordability update as uh, as far as you know what employees can can pay for their cost of their coverage before it's unaffordable. As uh, you see in 2018, currently they can't cost more than 9.56% of their box one W-2 income. And in 2019, it goes to 9.86% uh, uh, of what the individual coverage cannot cost more than for, for a, a person at your place of employment. So obviously, you know, going from 9.56 to 9.86, you know, makes it, uh, you know, that premium goes up just a touch. And I'm also, you know, letting you see if, if you've been basing your coverage of what you charge your employees for their share of the individual plan at your place of employment, um, what the federal poverty level uh, requirements are. Uh, so for 17, 18, you can see they're pretty much holding true there, but because of the increase to uh, the affordability going to 9.86% for 2019, uh, employees can pay up to $99.75 uh, and uh, the plan would be affordable. If, if, if you're using the federal poverty level for your employee base, the plan costs more than 99.75, then it would not be, um, not be affordable for those, those employees that, that have the lower incomes and so forth. In the federal poverty level, we don't have the federal poverty level yet for 2019. 
So what we use is um, uh, the federal poverty level as of six months prior to plan year. So this could change for those that have plan years that are uh, July, August, September, and so forth. If your plan year is, is uh, you know, those plan years and so forth. So just want to again touch base on the uh, employer shared responsibility payment notification, that letter 226J. Uh, I'll, to, to date, uh, clients that, that we work with that have received this letter, they've all been able to, to work with the, uh, the IRS and, and, have, and not have to pay any fines. Um, so again, we, we feel we think we've done the best for our clients to make sure they're often affordable, minimum value coverage, and they're not in that, in that, in that um, area should be receiving penalties. And even some of those clients that know they're not providing affordable minimum value coverage to everybody. They've elected not to. Knock on wood, you know, we haven't had any letters come out yet, come out back to them yet. Um, but I just want to make sure, and this is a lot, I did an AC update back in uh, February, and a lot of this is real similar, but I think it's very important. Uh, <clears throat> still, we're seeing penalties for 2015. We're not yet seeing penalties for 2016. Uh, but if you get one, it's seven pages of information, read through it. Please read through it. Yes, contact us, contact the agency you work with, uh, but you must read through it. And most important note is the response date. Uh, you, all you have to do is respond. Uh, if you feel you're due the penalty, obviously you pay it. If you're not due the penalty, you respond saying that we don't feel we're due this penalty. And the other, you know, the other item you're not going to miss is the proposed penalty amount, which is highlighted very, very soon, right after you get the dear employer. So uh, you're going to see your penalty, and you're going to see the date that you have to respond by. Uh, again, this is not a formal notice, and it's not a demand for payment. Uh, it's basically used to let you know uh, what. What's going on? Why are they determining that they think you're due a penalty? So uh, you're going to see a brief explanation of the pay or play provisions. Uh, you're going to get a ta table itemizing the proposed penalty month by month. And whether it's the A penalty or the B penalty, if it's the A penalty, they're telling you that you're not offering affordable or minimum value coverage to at least, well, for 2015, 70% of your eligible employees, uh, and that and that penalty is, you know, that's a heavy penalty because that's going to be based on your total number of employees, you know, minus 80 times whatever the penalty is, the 2,000 or the 2,100 and whatever it was for 15, obviously. So, uh, and the B penalty just says that you're offering coverage, minimum essential coverage to uh, your employees, but it's unaffordable. And that would be the B penalty. So, um, and then you're going to get uh, a form uh, that you're going to need to complete and sign. And you're also going to get a list of full-time employees that receive subsidized coverage in the month that they received it for. So you're going to see, um, you know, what the penalty is being based on and so forth. And then it's going to let you know what action you should take if you agree or disagree with the IRS. Um, and so forth. But remember, you need to be making, you need to be agreeing or disagreeing with, within that time frame that's stated right on page one of the letter you're going to receive, and so forth. Um, so if you agree, uh, check the box and say, I consent to the assessment and indicate payment method. And if you disagree, uh, you're going to check that box and, um, and move on and let the well, you're going to have to explain why you're disagreeing, and then the IRS will contact you back to, to talk to you about it. Uh, there's also full phone numbers on the, the cover letter, and we've had people, you know, yes, you know, call before their due date is up that they have to send a letter in, and they've got some of these penalties worked out, um, you know, right even before the, the date on the phone and so forth. So that's... Uh, uh, that's been a pretty good situation for most of our clients that have received the letter and so forth. So, 
enough on that. Well, um, one more, I apologize. Uh, I do feel that depending on your circumstances, if you call the IRS or if you notify the IRS, um, just start now saying, I disagree with this penalty and try to work it out. If it doesn't get worked out, uh, then you obviously you want to receive help on that. Um, who should that help come from? Should it be your agent, third party, or legal? Um, I personally would recommend any one of our clients, if they get pushback and they feel that they're still not due these penalties and the IRS is still saying you're due them, uh, I believe you should get a practicing benefits attorney, a risk attorney uh, involved because any future discussion you have on why you feel you shouldn't, should or should not be, uh, or shouldn't have these penalties applied, I think it's very important that you have client attorney privilege. And because if you tell me something and I get called to the stand, I have to spill my guts. So you want to make sure you deal with a practicing attorney, I think, if you're really going to fight these and so forth. Um, part of the employer mandate and part of the employer shared responsibility notifications that you might be getting um, is a notice that you should receive uh, when an employee receives a subsidy from the exchange. You know, they're, they're, they're claiming that they're working for you and they're claiming that uh, you offer coverage that's either not affordable, doesn't even have value, or maybe they claiming that they work for you and you don't offer coverage. We don't know what they're stating until we get the letter. Um, but basically, if an employee receives a subsidy, uh, you should be getting letter 1411. Uh, and there's actually some court cases right now from some businesses that are getting fines that said they never got the section 1411 certifications and they're fighting back because it, it's kind of, you're supposed to get both. You're supposed to get the 1411 first and then now they're following up with the actual notifications that you do a penalty. And, you know, again, across the country, our employers that are fighting the penalty are saying that the guidelines that we were due the penalty were not followed because we never got these certifications. Uh, so if you get a 1411 certification, again, um, from the exchange, uh, you have 90 days to appeal if you feel that the employee is not due a subsidy and you want to make sure you comply with those. And really for a couple of reasons, probably in the best interest of the employee, obviously it's in your best interest, but there's even some, you know, interest in the employee here because if you have an employee that gets a subsidy and they're not due that subsidy, they have to pay that, they will be asked to pay that back in the future. Um, and typically the way they're paying those back is uh, if they're ever due a refund from their federal taxes, um, and when they file taxes, uh, they might not get that refund. Uh, the IRS will keep it if they see that, that they owe money. Uh, I did see again another article again in, a, in a publication where for 2015, uh, I believe, hundreds of millions of dollars, I, I thought it was like $400 million of subsidies that were paid out in air um, that, they're, that they're looking at now. So, uh, you know, and the IRS, not the marketplace, determines if you are due a penalty, and that would be the ESRP notification we just talked about and so forth. So, and what's on again, what's off again, uh, extensions and delays, the individual, in small group employer plans, now what we have called or are known as what they call transitional or grandmother coverage, can now be renewed through December 31st, 2019. Um, so the can's been kicked down another year, a year on that as well. So if you have a plan, if you're a small employer or an individual, and you have a plan that's not an ACA plan, that's community rated or it's not a, you know, your platinum gold, uh, you can renew that coverage, uh, again, all the way through the end of this year and through the end of, of next year. Not independent on, on the carrier you're with uh, and what limitations they might apply, so forth. Um, well, on July 7th, um, the CMS, uh, Centers for Medicaid Services, 
halted and then back on July 24th, they continued risk adjustment payments and collections. What are these? These are required again by the ACA. Uh, and this is, these are uh, payments and collections uh, from insurers on their individual ACA plans and their, and their small group businesses that are, that are in ACA plans. Uh, but our current administration was gonna pull those payments and that would have affected carriers uh, quite a bit um, and, and so forth because they're not gonna get any risk adjustment payments. And these are carriers that took on or have written a higher number of higher risk people and they have obviously higher claims because of that. Uh, they would get payments from the federal government. Where would this money come from? It comes from other insurers that are participating in small group insurance and individual plans that took on a lower risk population. So it's kind of a, you know, Rob Peter to pay Paul. Um, and the current administration is gonna halt these. And then obviously, you know, 17 days later, they decided, no, we're gonna continue these for this year. Uh, next year is well, on the table, but this year they are going to continue those payments where they're going to be obviously collecting money from some carriers to, to give to other carriers and so forth. And, and the big concern here was if they stopped that, um, carriers would have obviously had to increase their costs higher, obviously to pay for the additional claims for those that had policies with them and so forth. So so that's, that's, that's on again, off again. Um, Cadillac taxes currently delayed to 2022. Um, there is uh, currently a moratorium on medical device tax. Uh, that's a tax for those who make medical devices. Uh, and that's been extended for 2018 and 19. It's currently, it's currently a moratorium for 16 and 17 that's been extended. Uh, and annual fee on health insurance providers is suspended again for 2019. That fee was suspended for 17. We had it back for 18, and now it's going to be suspended for 19. And I'm sure all of you that look at renewal letters where it's, it's shown what's the medical, you know, what are the taxes and fees that we are paying when you look at your renewal. Uh, this is a big deal because most renewals for 18, what we're seeing, uh, the increase in the renewal cost because of the, the annual fee on health insurance providers is about, on average, I would say 3%. You know, nationally I've heard three to 5%. So that's a, that's a big fee. So that will not be, that should not be on your renewals for 2019. Um, I say should not be, because we're hearing some carriers have kind of, depending on when you renew, if you might see this fee on your renewal, although it will be greatly reduced from prior years, uh, uh, just by the way that they calculated the fee and how they're spreading the risk amongst all their clients and so forth. So you have to just deal with, you know, the carrier, look at your renewal, work with us. Uh, if, if the fee is zero, great. If there is a fee, have our have the insurance care explain why there's still the fee on there. And, and, and how they're balancing it. And if there's still a fee this year, they should explain why. Maybe the fee should have been a little bit lower last year than other carriers if they're spreading the risk. So, um, ACA reporting, uh, we do have the ACA reporting out, but right now we currently don't only have the draft forms. Um, and just seeing all these draft forms are very, very similar to the 2017 versions. Probably the only difference uh, that I've seen is instead of saying 2017, they say 2018. So they're very similar. Uh, and the filing dates are currently uh, the, the 1095s that need to be provided to your employees uh, need to be provided this year. That date is by January 31st. Um, and then as far as getting forms to the uh, IRS, if uh, these would be the 1094, the transmittal with the 1095. The filing dates for that is to the IRS if you do it by paper. Uh, they have to be there by February 28th. And if you do it electronically, uh, it has to be the IRS by uh, April 1st. Um, 
And again, employers submitting more than 250 and 95s per tax ID number um, must submit electronically. And again, it's per tax ID number. So if you're a combined and controlled group that's a large employer because you, there's four businesses involved that are commonly controlled and you know fall under that control group law for IRS 414, uh, and you only have you know 50 employees in a couple of your groups, uh, they would not have. To, they're not forced to file electronically. Anybody can file electronically, except if you have 250 or more, you definitely have to. Um, so, uh, and speaking of filing forms electronically, uh, this is a pr proposed IRS electronic filing rule. It's not carbon granted yet. It hasn't been uh, put into place, but it's proposed. And what the IRS is proposing is as some of you, as those who have are filing uh, information returns of 250 or more, you know that you've been having to file your W-2s electronically. Um, and if you've been, if you have 250 or more 1095s, you've been filing those electronically. Same thing for 1099s, although that we don't deal with that with the ACA, but that's one of the information uh, uh, returns that's required. So currently, it's if you file 250 more of each respective form. So example, you know, employer filing 260 W-2s must file those electronically. But if you only have 200 1095s that have to be filed, you can file those electronic or paper. Uh, I think with the technologies that's out there uh, and is out there that most are filing you know, all their forms electronically, but what's uh, changing in the rule uh, is finalized. Will we, this, will, this will apply to returns that are filed after of this year. And basically what the proposed rule is going to be is all information returns an employer files, if this adds up to 250 or more, electronic filing will be required. Uh, so, example, an employer that is filing 150 W-2s and 110 1095s for 2018 would have to file both information returns electronically in 2019. So for those of you who have been filing everything by paper because you had, didn't have to file more than 250, if the total of the returns that you file add up to 250 or more, uh, with this, if this proposed rule comes into play and is enacted on, uh, you will have to for 2019, any, any forms that you file in 2019, you'll have to file those electronically. Um, so we're just kind of, I want to alert people out there to this because you may have to start looking now um, preparing for this rule and being ready to be able to file uh, electronic, uh, if the information returns um, electronically, uh, we think that's a important thing you should be looking at. Obviously, if this proposed rule does come into play and, and it is going to be enforced, you know, we'll be getting information out to everybody we can, our clients and so forth, and we'll have stuff, I'm sure, on our, our website that people can have access to to know that that's happening and so forth. Um, but obviously, as we know, under current law, this example employer would not have to file anything electronically because they're not over 250 for the specific forms and so forth. Um, uh, so, and as well as not only the original returns would have to be filed electronically, if you have to do any corrected returns, they would have to be filed electronically as well. So what the new law is saying is you file electronically because you're required to because of the 250 uh, threshold. Even if you only have to file two or three corrected returns, they have to be filed electronically as well in 2019. So thank you. Um, and again, we still have uh, 
out there for small employers, uh, health reimbursement account availability that allows them to help pay for coverage if they don't provide a group plan and they just want to help employees out with their individual coverage to help pay for that and so forth. Uh, we, we know this is out there. We've talked to our clients about our small employers. We as of yet have not had a small employer uh, drop their current health plan to move to this type of a program because again, when you look at all the hurdles to jump and all the guidelines, it's, it's too confusing and actually in most cases it would have cost the employer more. Um, so it hasn't really been a, an area of boon for small employers to say, gee, I can finally save money now and I can, I can move on to something else and get out of providing group insurance to my employees. And not that employees, small employers want to do that, but those who have even thought about it and looked at it, when we do the cost, we've, we've shown that uh, it's going to cost more and there's a lot of red tape and a lot of hurdles and a lot of documentation and notifications that they have to do on an ongoing basis that would just, again, you know, too many rules to make it make it a viable program to, to want to get involved with. And I don't, we don't have any clients that did this that weren't even provided group insurance in the first place that said, hey, now this is out there, I'll get involved and help my, help my employees out. I don't know of anybody that's taken these on and so forth. And I've talked to the companies that do the administration for these, and yes, they have some they have some clients on board, but it wasn't a it wasn't a you know a, a boon to them at all of, of writing new business because of this and so forth. So health savings accounts again, this is not a, a ACA thing, but I like to add it um, because um, uh, it's just nice to know about the health savings accounts that are out there. What employers can do what's changing. Um, again, I'm going to remind people that anybody contributing to a health savings account, your money goes in tax free, it grows tax free, uh, and it can be withdrawn tax free if for qualified expenses. So you've got a lot of benefits there. Uh, no changes in 2019 on the minimum deductible. The minimum deductible is going to stay at $1,350 for single, uh, $2,700 for family, and at this point in time, no changes. Plans can still not have any office or drug co-pays uh, without satisfying the deductible first. Um, exception would be ACA preventive care. Required care is covered 100%. And I say at this time because, and I'm not going to get into this because I'm um, too often I explain what's been passed in the Congress and we've done a big thing on that. And then the Senate says, forget it, we're not going to allow it. So. Uh, if something gets approved and going to be effective and, and the government's going to allow it, uh, we'll talk about it. But things that are out there, they're just kind of hanging out there, uh, we're not talking about. But there are some bills, you see, you know, a couple bills that have passed the Congress to make HSAs, you know, enhance them, make them more viable. And when we know what that is, for sure, uh, we'll talk about it. So uh, the maximum out of pocket on HSAs is going up. Uh, in 2019, so the maximum spend a uh, single can have is 67.50. Uh, the maximum spend a family can have is uh, is 13.50. So, one thing I did include here is the ACA maximum out of pocket for 2019. That's going to 7,900 dollars for single and uh, 15.8 for for family. And what this is is the saying that the ACA limits the total spend for an individual is $7,900. That being their deductibles, their co-insurances, their drug co-pays, you know, their office co-pays, you know, they can add, once they add up, if they add up to that amount, then for the remainder of the, the plan year, you know, that individual or family, if the family hits 15-8, would have no more drug co-pays, office co-pays, deductibles, co-insurances, and so forth. And how does that kind of tie in with high deductible health plans? Remember, to, to contribute to a HSA, you have to meet certain guidelines, and that's minimum deductibles, maximum out of pockets, can't have other coverage that's not HSA compatible. But uh, the deductibles on HSAs, qualified plans, uh, work two ways. Um, 
certain plans have to have what they call an aggregate deductible, meaning that if you have family coverage and your family deductible, even though your single deductible maybe is 2,500, if your family deductible is 5,000, that's aggregate for the family. So it could be one person hitting 5,000 in family coverage, or it could be uh, you know addition of all the family members adding up to 5,000. So there are some plans out there that have an aggregate family deductible, let's say $10,000. If that's the case, even though the HSA guidelines say that, or the, the plan guidelines say the aggregate family deductible of 10,000, because the ACA puts a maximum of 7,900, no more than any one person in that family plan could have $7,900 of charges. So. Still a lot of money, I know, but at least it's not the 10,000. So, an individual in a plan that has an aggregate deductible of well, higher than 7,900, any single people within that plan would be protected at the $7,900 limit, and so forth. That's just kind of want to add that in there, and so forth. Uh, contribution levels uh, are are going up for 19. I did include 18 uh, because you can make you're still making your 18 contributions and and you can make your 18 contributions all the way up to the tax filing, the 2018 tax filing date, which April 1st, or is it April 15th? I apologize. 15th, thank you. I'm getting too many dates in my mind here. Uh, and currently, singles, those that have single coverage can put 30, uh, $3,450 in, and those that have family coverage can put $6,900 in, and it's going for 19, those amounts are going to $3,507,000. And I want to remind people 55 and over, you can contribute an extra thousand dollars catch up. And that's in the year that you turn 55. You know, you, if you turn 55 this year, you can put in an extra thousand dollars for this year. Okay. Um, I also want to, uh, I'm not going to talk about workplace wellness compliance with the DOL and EEOC. A lot of things out there. Many of you have workplace wellness programs in place. Uh, uh, organization that we're members of, Benefit Advisors Network, uh, just had a webinar for our compliance director yesterday on this. And I listened to it. It's very good. And again, it's very complex. We, I couldn't do justice in the two, two, two or three minutes I have left. You know, this is a full hour webinar. And I want, I'm going to direct you, I'm going to let you know that since it was yesterday, this webinar should be ready for us to put on our website in the next couple days. As soon as it is, we're going to have it on our website for you to be able to listen. So you got our website here, housemanjohnson.com. Uh, you'll find our website. On the menu bar, look for webinars and events. You'll see webinar archive. Uh, that's where all our webinars have been archived that we've done. Uh, look for workplace wellness programs in compliance with the DOL and EEOC rules. Uh, and again, that's just not, it's going to be a webinar that's put on by Stacy Barrow. I know Stacy, and uh, he is Benefit Advisors Network's Compliance Director. Uh, the firm he is with is Marathas Barrow Weatherhead LL, uh, Lent LLP, and he specializes, or their firm specializes in employee benefits, executive compensation, and employment law. Uh, Stacy does a lot of speaking nationally and does a lot of our programs for more than just the Benefit Advisors Network, so he's sought after. And I think you'll appreciate this webinar and the complexity of the, you know, the rules on wellness programs today uh, with the DOL and EEOC guidelines and so forth. So, so that said, I don't have any more to talk about on my end, so if there's any questions out there, uh, I'd be happy to answer those. This time we don't have any, but if you do want to have a question, you want to type it into the your uh, question box, um, please do, and we'll get it answered. If you have any questions at all, uh, you have my contact information here, both my direct line and my, my email. Be more than happy to answer now or at a later time. 
All right, and we just want to thank all of you for attending Pat Kelly's ACR Update webinar. This recorded webinar, along with a PDF format of the PowerPoint, will be emailed to all attendees within the next few days. The webinar will also be available on the webinar archive section of our website. Our next webinar will be September 20th on the impact of cyber claims, and we hope you will attend. Thank you again for attending our webinar, and we hope to hear from you soon.